Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. This is the Fast Friday edition of the show for July 31st, 2020. And if you're just looking at the title of this episode, you might be thinking, Bolden, why are we talking about American independence? It's almost August. Save it for next summer. And I know we're all familiar with July 4th, the adoption of the Declaration of Independence by the Second Continental Congress pursuant to the Lee Resolution of July 2nd, but it wasn't actually signed for the most part until August 2nd that year. And on August 1st, 1776, Samuel Adams, who many call the father of the American Revolution, he gave what was considered at the time a famous speech in support of American independence on the steps of the State House in Philadelphia, which was the meeting place for the Second Continental Congress. So in this episode, I wanna go through some of the highlights of that speech. But first of all, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. If you go to our show homepage, you're gonna find everything that you need for this show, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. You'll find all of our archives for over two years in individual episodes. I've got links to important references that you references and articles and sometimes source documents, other episodes for you to learn more because I just scratched the surface in each episode. You can also find all the platforms we're on both video live streaming, audio only podcast. You can find our email newsletter, social media channels, and even our membership program where you can support us for as little as two bucks a month. We make it go a really long way here at the TAC. And I'm so grateful for every one of you who is supporting us with your financial faith. Thank you. Again, that's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And I'm so grateful for you spending some of your time with me today. But since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this done in 15 minutes or less. And I'm just going to go through some of the highlights. Again, I'm going to link to the full speech in the show notes so you can read it in its entirety. I think you'll probably recognize at least a few of the quotes here, which were pretty famous and pretty well known over the years. And he starts out talking about how they live under this system of a hereditary hereditary king who can make laws in all cases whatsoever. And he rejects that notion. And this is right near the beginning. He says, we have explored the temple of royalty and found that the idol we have bowed down to has eyes which see not, ears that hear not our prayers, and a heart like the nether millstone. We have this day restored the sovereign to whom alone men ought to be obedient. And he goes on, and I think this is applicable today, and it made me think too, because sometimes when we look all around us and we're like, look at all the problems and how many people are ignorant about the proper role of government or the Constitution, about the principles of liberty, and they have the tools with the internet, they have the tools around them to learn, but should we always think of them as our enemy? No, not necessarily, according to Samuel Adams. He says, having been a slave to the influence of opinions early acquired, and distinctions generally received, I am ever inclined not to despise, but pity those who are yet in darkness. And of course, that doesn't mean he necessarily wants to consider them allies, but as long as they're in darkness, he sees them as a victim. And I do see all of us as victims of the largest government in the history of the world. Going further about the notion of a hereditary king having control over the people of America, he says, according to their doctrine, the offspring of perhaps the lewd embraces of a successful invader shall, from generation to generation, arrogate the right of lavishing on their pleasures a proportion of the fruits of the earth. I mean, if you think about it, it just sounds absurd. You've got an invader and then they have kids and all of a sudden they own everything. It's just, it's despotism. They claim the authority to manage them like beasts of burden, the people, and without superior industry, capacity, or virtue. Nay, though disgraceful to humanity by their ignorance. There's so many of them are just dumb. They have no clue what's going on, but yet they claim power and they use it in very vicious ways. Ignorance and temperance and brutality shall be deemed best calculated to frame laws and to consult for the welfare of society. And I would think today, we have many people in government, especially in Washington, D.C., who fit that description by Samuel Adams. 
He goes a little further and he talks about how the, the people of England were his brethren. He says, when I behold my country, once the seat of industry, peace, and plenty, changed by Englishmen to a theater of blood and misery, heaven forgive me, if I cannot root out those passions which it has implanted in my bosom and detest submission. I just want to highlight, he detests submission. He talks about resistance. We know his actions in Boston and elsewhere really showed that he meant it. He didn't just say it. He detests submission to a people who have either ceased to be human or have not virtue enough to feel their own wretchedness and servitude. He was kind of calling out the English, saying like, look, you guys are living in a state of unlimited submission as well. You got to get rid of your own problems, but we don't want any part of it. He goes further and he says, political right and public happiness are different words for the same idea. And I was, I had to read through this a couple of times over the years to, before it really made sense. But he's talking about the propaganda machine that is the empire. And at the time, it was the empire of the king. Now it's a different one. He says, the advocates for a despotic government, this is so true, the advocates for a despotic government and non-resistance to the magistrate employ reasons in favor of their systems drawn from a consideration of their tendency to promote public happiness. We hear this over and over and over. If you don't support this program, then you support 40 million people dying in the streets. If you don't support this unconstitutional act or this foreign war, whatever it may be, there's always a segment of the population that's going to supposedly benefit from it. And he knew that, but he rejected the whole idea outright. And he goes on, he says, courage then, my countrymen. Our contest is not only whether we ourselves shall be free, but whether there shall be left to mankind an asylum on earth for civil and religious liberty. And I think that's one of the quotes that many of us have heard over the years. That's one of the most famous ones from this speech. There's another in just a bit. He goes on, and there were people who were basically saying, like, look, well, maybe, maybe they're going to work this out. There's still time. Maybe we can get the, the, the king, we can get parliament to come to their senses. We've been sending petitions for a decade plus. Maybe now is the time because we're putting, we're putting things on the line. There's a line in the sand. But he is actually pointing out that it isn't even if they grant petitions, they respond to them, or they do what the people want, because he's recognized that it's the system itself that's the problem. And he put it this way, from the day on which an accommodation takes place between England and America on any other terms than as independent states, independent states, not one independent nation, again, of course, 13 independent sovereign states, I shall date the ruin of this country. A politic minister will study to lull us into security by granting us the full extent of our petitions. He's saying, look, even if they gave us the full extent of our petitions, this is a political maneuver because he, like so many others, George Mason, James Madison, and of course the famous Lord Acton quote of power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And the king in parliament held absolute final authority, total power, could do no wrong in essence, because of that sovereignty. And he knew that even if they were granted the petitions, that over time that power would corrupt and this was the time to take action when they had the support that he felt that they needed to get things done. And this is probably the most famous quote from this whole speech. Of course, he says, if ye love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude than the animating contest of freedom, go from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that ye were our countrymen. And that one is just so timeless. And of course, he goes on further talking about the structure of the government, the structure of the supposed, the way that Great Britain was treating the people in America, and that Total supremacy and final authority just could never work. And he goes, that he put it this way, to unite the supremacy of Great Britain and the liberty of America is utterly impossible. 
So vast a continent and of such a distance from the seat of empire will every day grow more unmanageable. And that's how I feel about basically every one of the 50 states, which are so far away in theory, in thought, in process, and in many cases distance from the seat of power in Washington, D.C. He says, the motion of so unwieldy a body cannot be directed with any dispatch and uniformity without committing to the Parliament of Great Britain powers inconsistent with our freedom. So when they have power over everything, and Samuel Adams, I am starting to think, was basically the original 10th Amendment supporter, the original 10th. -er. But his view was, look, as long as they have to deal with everything rather than leaving us alone to deal with our own things, as long as they claim the power to, in all cases, bind the people of America, of the colonies, of the several states, then Parliament would eventually have powers inconsistent with freedom. And that's how it's played out today. As long as they have too much power, that's always the way it's going to play out. And he reminds us, he says, remember that the men who wish to rule over you are they who, in pursuit of this plan of despotism, annulled the sacred contracts which had been made with your ancestors. And for us, that contract, that sacred contract, we could call it, would be the Constitution for the United States. And every single day, every single moment, agents of the federal government are annulling that contract by violating its original legal meaning and intent. He says, they've conveyed into your cities a mercenary soldiery to compel you to submission by insult and murder, who called your patience cowardice, your piety hypocrisy. I just want to close it out with this. And of course, you can read through the entire speech. It's really interesting. He talks about uh, a lot of great stuff. But here is how he sums it up. And he just wanted to be with everyone else, fighting and standing for free and independent states. And he says, for my own part, I ask no greater blessing than to share with you the common danger and common glory. And he mentions two heroes of the revolution. One I know for sure was a, a very close friend of his, Joseph Warren. He says, if I have a wish dearer to my soul than that, if I have a wish dearer to my soul than that, my ashes may be mingled with those of a Warren and Montgomery. It is that these American states may never cease to be free and independent. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I really love reading through this, and I, maybe I should make this kind of an annual thing to go through different parts of this particular speech, because, of course, we're never taught about this in school as we're growing up. But I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something that's more important than anything. And I really do appreciate you spending some of your time with me today. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to smash the like button. You can subscribe on places like YouTube and get notifications. Or if you're listening on a podcast platform, Podbean, iTunes, and elsewhere, you can leave reviews. All of those actions tell the platform's algorithm to show the program to more and more people. And it is working. We are growing slowly and steadily. We're reaching more and more people with this message of the Constitution and liberty every single week. Thank you for helping out. And if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, you can join us as a member, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members, where you can pitch in as little as two bucks a month, and we make it go a long, long way for liberty. Again, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.